as the old song and expression goes, you say tomato, I say tomato, let's call the whole thing off. Well, in the world of business and also in life, you're right, I'm right, who's wrong? And tonight is about the wrongness of being right. And I'm going to be joined by my wonderful friend and next big win partner, Joe. But before that, folks, you know it's going to be the ritual. Get that blood boiling and pumping up around your system with a little bit of intro music. <laughs> With that little bit of snake drum, we're back in the room. Good evening, Joe. Yeah. Good evening. Can you see me when the music's playing? I can actually. I can see you doing your little hand movement and little jiving. No. I can't see you. You see, uh, so that's probably that's... very. That's probably very good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I've no idea what you're doing, but no. Um, so, good evening. Hello, everybody. We are talking about the wrongness of being right, which I think is a great um, subtitle for this episode. Um, so, you know, those situations where you're absolutely convinced you're right, other people are seeing it differently, you get frustrated because, you know, everybody's got a different point of view and it feels really, really hard to move forward. So we're going to be talking about those times amongst others, what they mean for you and your business, and some tips on how you can think through that and strategize through it as well. So we've got quite a lot planned and there's some more besides, isn't there, Mahmood? There is indeed. And in our usual practice, by the way, folks, I have no idea <coughs> what Joe's going to say, except I know it's going to be really good and I'm going to learn some stuff from it as well. Uh, I've made some predictions like Mystic Meg and what might come out of Joe's mouth and all the rest of it. But whatever it's going to be, if you've got some contributions to make, obviously put in hashtag replay, put stuff in the comments box. We'll pick it up as well. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts as we go through this here. Um, yeah. So I think it's um, it's interesting about the importance of being right or wrong. And um, part of that, the interplay into that, is is how you va how much you value the relationship, isn't it? Yeah, I think you're right there. I mean, I think um, it's, it's interesting, actually. In a majority, I mean, I don't know if life imitates business, but there's a lot of situations here where people very much personalise their dialogues, their interactions there as well. Um, and it, if it's not dealt with correctly, I think, you know, we all see the world through different spectacles, but it can be quite a negative situation in terms of whether you're dealing with somebody in your own team, whether you're dealing with a supplier or a customer here, it can create quite a lot of negative vibes. And I think we'll talk about solutions later on, but I think the way people view those dialogues and conversations could be quite toxic, quite destructive. Yeah, and I think it comes down to, um, as well, how we handle it are the stories that we tell ourselves and what we think we need from other people and how we feel when we don't get it. So other people seeing things differently and not budging and how they deal with it actually is as much about us, if not more, than it is about them sometimes. So there's quite a lot to unpick in this show. Um, so where do you want to start? That's a great, oh, a great. Thing. I think we're going to have sort of part on the psychiatrist chair here. I think to begin with, and all the rest of it. I think that's a great point. I think our attitudes to uh, how we exchange and how we interact with people is probably as much about the baggage we pick up as we grow up, as much about other people's voices in our own head, and it's about not having that confidence in our inner being here. I know it sounds very hippie woo and all the rest of it about when we make that exchange here. It's a like a determination that. I think some people think they've got, they're not being heard. They're not being listened to. Uh, some people look at it as a competition there as well. So I think let's start from the beginning why we think it actually occurs in the first place. Okay. So going back to, you know, the root cause of, of things is that um, different people have a different perspective. They see the same thing in, in different ways. And I hear this sometimes. I'll, I'll hear people coming out of a meeting or a, a workshop or something and there could have been 20 people in there and there are 20 different versions of of what they thought was important and what was said and how it felt and and all of those things so um, we all take away our own interpretation of stuff and nobody's wrong 
uh, and nobody's right. When it's perception, nobody's wrong and nobody's right. It's just it's just different, isn't it? Um, there are uh, sometimes conversations, of course, around facts and some people arguing, you know, with something and actually, is, is it factually correct or not? So I think that it's different as well, whether it's a factual thing or a perception thing, because we can all have our own um, perceptions and opinions, but really, there should only be one set of facts. Interesting. I mean, I, 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 I 99% agree with you on that one, Joe. I think there's a very small thing, and again, depending on what sort of facts we're referring to. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember coming across this concept about paradigm shifts many years ago here, and things that we take as received wisdom and factual are based on the best evidence we have at that point in time. But something else might come along later on, uh, and actually actually alter our perspective and what we thought was a fact may not be. I know it's the very big picture stuff like the yeah. world is flat. Some people are flat earth still, but, you know, predominantly received wisdom is most people would say the earth is not flat and the earth is more than 2000 years old because it's backed up mm. by fossils and the rest of it. So, But, but that, that is that the facts are still the facts. The fact, you know, the best facts we had were back then. And the best facts we've got are now. So the facts are the facts. Um, and of course, when we're talking about statistics, research and those things, those aren't necessarily facts. Um, that's data and that's interpretation. It depends how you do your modelling and how you do the analysis. So um, there are some facts, some some things that we know and some things that we don't. Um, but I think it's about, you know, are we, are we talking about hard data where we can demonstrate it, yes, yes or no, really clearly either way, or is it about the you know grey areas? And where it is grey areas, it's um, that's the bit sometimes where people can get a bit hung up on trying to demonstrate their right, rather than being open to hearing somebody else's point of view so that they can influence and or learn from that alternative perspective because there might be something in it that they've not seen so when we are too focused on on trying to demonstrate how right we are we close ourselves down to learning yeah i think that's a great point there about that emphasis about proving that we're right as opposed to listening to the other person i think there's two elements that come out of that is that old cliche thing about you know we've got one of these we've got two of these but we tend to overuse that uh, at the expense of actually the two ears for listening to people and all the rest of it and i think there's a thing i think we covered it on previous shows as well is that facts are facts. Let's take that as received wisdom. However, most people make their decisions and form their opinions based on emotion more than facts. And I think that's probably, we can call it where the problem lies, if we use that expression there. The problem lies in is about our own emotional intelligence, our own emotion that comes into it, which causes a lot of that disharmony. Yeah. So what's, what's happening when our emotions come into something? is um, so we've all got emotional needs right so those are things like uh, and it's different for everybody there's some common ones that that a lot of people have but it is different for everybody and we've all got a few of these so um, I want to be loved I want to be liked I want to be in control I want to be comfortable I want things to stay the same I want things to be different I want to be heard Um, I want to succeed you know I want to be right uh, all of those things are emotional needs. and um, But the thing is, if I were to say to you, Mahmood, who is, as a healthy adult human, who is responsible for your emotional needs? Well, ultimately, it's, it's down to me. It's down to you, yeah. So what we do is, even though we're, we're responsible and other people can, you know, hopefully treat us um, respectfully and all of those things, so that, that's, you know, we should expect that from others, I hope. But the, uh, what we do is we expect other people to fulfill those emotional needs for us um, by how they interact with us. And then when they don't, we get upset or we get miffed or cheesed off or frustrated or whatever it is. So I need to be heard. I need to be properly understood. And they're not understanding me. You know, they're just not listening. Uh, then we get frustrated. So um, but actually, it's not their job to fulfill our need. It's yeah, our that- job to fulfill our need. Agreed on that one. So what is it? So if we accept the fact that that that's a, a big component part of it, um, I would probably throw something else into the mix as well. Mm. And I think sometimes there's a, a disconnect between 
the receiver of the information and the provider of that information in terms of yeah. either by, by language that's actually being used. So language may be inaccessible to the receiver. Uh, it may be such that, and I'm not talking as an intellectual thing, but that uh, level of uh, communication levels, intellect and all the rest of it may be disparate. And I think there's an issue there as well. I think the language style that we use, uh, we like to think that we're quite indifferent to what people are like, we're all different. But I think we do react to how somebody presents themselves, what yeah. they look like image-wise. Uh, and those actually cause some barriers to come up and cause some disharmony as well. well they're, tr they're triggers, aren't they? So it could yeah. be that somebody subliminally, with you know, subconsciously reminds us of somebody who was really horrible to us at school or a former colleague we had or somebody who dumped us, you know, when uh, in our 20s or whatever it is. Um, so, and sometimes we don't perceive that, but, that, or, you know, there, it could be a mannerism. It could be that they don't look like it or they use a similar phrase or a similar word and subconsciously we connect back to that experience. Um, but it really comes down to us understanding, I think, what, what triggers us when, you know, when somebody's... Um, saying that we're wrong and, and is being different and how we're feeling about that if emotion if our emotions are coming into it um ask ourselves why and then choose to do something different in response so for instance i i really hate being misunderstood um and i really hate not being um listened to when i'm trying to explain something to somebody and um so i am aware of that and I do my best to manage that, you know, and um, put in place strategies so that I know that's that. Oh, this is this is about to happen, right? So, I'm, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this instead, and this is going to be my strategy. Um, and sometimes my strategy is to be really direct and say, "Look, I don't think you are listening, and I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying." Um, so. Could we just focus in on this and you know, and hear me out? And I will be quite direct about that. And I'll, and sometimes the strategy is to ask for, for what I need, not dodge what I need. What, what I was intrigued about that, Joan. What in, what influences you to be more direct in a situation as opposed to use an alternative route? I think it depends on how respectful I believe the other person is being towards me. So if I can if I think they're trying but still not hearing, then I'll try and work with them. I'll try and rephrase things, draw it, you know, do do something different to um, to just not keep seeing. The thing is, you know, not, don't keep saying the same thing in the same way and expecting people to suddenly get it. But when I think people are just being, you know, obstructive or difficult, if, they, if their behaviours are things like they're talking over you, they're talking down to you, um, those sorts of um, you know minor aggressions, really. Then that's where I cut you know cut them off, and I'm really direct with it. Yeah, that, it's interesting. I mean, I, I've been in uh, meetings and conversations before, um, and I think sometimes what can get quite frustrating is if you've got a meeting about a particular project or a particular thing. If somebody hasn't done the minimum preparation for that meeting, like read the papers and done the background for it as well, and they come to that conversation with a certain point of view, but they haven't actually done any of the initial evaluation and reading and all the rest of it. I think that can be quite frustrating. That can cause uh, a lot of discontent. So I think what you were saying earlier on about the responsibility on the individual here, that's mm. a good example of something to prevent that discontent. Here's the thing. I actually think, though, sometimes, you know, actually disagreeing is actually a good thing here. Uh, and actually it can, be a, it can lead to really positive, good outcomes if you've got the rules rules there to how to not have you don't agree i'm just disagreeing because you said it was good to disagree so i was just having some fun i actually agree with you um but well, uh, see, i was using my tactic there i was saying oh okay you don't agree with me then <laughs> <laughs> but yeah because i think tensions are good and i think sometimes people want to i think i, I hate generalizations so i'm going to generalize I think we've lost the ability or a lot of people have lost the ability to actually look at something and say in that zone, in that moment where we're talking about a project, where we're talking about a strategy, we're talking about this, we're talking about a team member, we can have that conversation, forget about what that relationship is outside of that conversation. We may not agree. 
and I'm going to hear your point, and we might actually not actually agree at the end. It creates a bit of tension, and because people don't like that tension, they will do whatever they can to cut the conversation down, and that just creates more frustration. Yes, I I um I agree with that, and I think um I think I think disagreement is important. I I, I genuinely do, um and disagreement is the most effective when it's done in a psychologically safe, trusting um, relationship slash environment. And that's, that so. sounded like, that sounded a bit, you know. You know <laughs> and, but, it's a family so, show, so folks, but obviously there's a yeah. coming across the screen. <laughs> so what, what I mean by that is um, we could debate and have completely different points of view and, and actually enjoy the debate and enjoy the challenge uh, but as long as I know that you still think, you know, you think I'm okay, you think I'm a good person, you think I know what I'm talking about, you respect what I do, because we're in a work, you know, we're talking about from a work perspective, um, you think I'm a credible professional, and um, I think the same, all of those things of you. So we can have a great debate and know that it doesn't affect the relationship, yeah, I think because we're perfect. debating the topic. Where people struggle to debate often is where they don't have the, the foundation of that relationship or they don't they don't feel secure in their environment. I mean, sometimes we have to have a debate with a customer that we've met for the very first time, right? And we've got to make a, a judgment call in terms of, you know, we're constantly, as humans, assessing how 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 safe is it here for me to. So so within if we can create in our businesses really good environments where we all know where we stand and we know that um me challenging you you challenging me doesn't mean um it isn't a bad thing because underneath it all we all want the same things we've got the same values we respect each other it's just about this stuff over here you know it depersonalizes it and it can also make it really fun and stimulating i think a great environment to work in but it's when the relationship when when the environment and the team you know and the leadership is is toxic when it's competitive when it's self interested um when you've got a bit of narcissistic ambition thrown in there you know i've i've been around as have you for 30 odd years in all sorts of different environments so i've seen all of those and experienced all of those in action um that's when we get afraid to challenge, you know, and people are afraid of, I've seen people not wanting to go into meetings because they're frightened of what person X is going to say and how they're going to say it and will it be demeaning. And, and that's not what we want. Yeah, I fully, I fully endorse that. I've been in lots of meetings where you've either got a very, what I call autocratic chair that actually mm -hmm. doesn't let people speak and doesn't let people contribute. Uh, you've got a situation where somebody might, ask a question that in that meeting, in that conversation, and they're shut down or they're given a very peripheral answer and people are actually not supportive of that. So I think you, creating that learning environment, creating that environment, that safe space where it says, look, we've all got a common good. And I, and I draw on our own uh, practical experience, by the way. So when we did the next iteration of Next Big Win and when we spoke about it, we didn't necessarily agree with every single thing that was how it was going to unfold. But what, what made it much easier to achieve where we are now and what we're going to achieve going forward is we we have to share the same values same outcome uh i respect your uh your level of professionalism intelligence ability uh easy to have that yeah. dialogue so that's mm -hmm. thrown in and we folks i know you might not think so but we don't always agree with each other but we respect each other's contribution to that conversation and we'll come up with a consensus yeah and what we do is we find and this is this is for um for you know a tip for everybody really is find what you've got in common so a lot of a lot of people where they're finding the relationship different uh, difficult because the differences are big is because they're focusing on the difference so if that's not working for you do something different don't keep focusing on you know what you've always done focus on where you can come together and what you do agree on and then build out from there um but i think this, you know, we need to explore why it's so important for us to be right. And a lot of that as humans has to do with us wanting to save face, not be embarrassed, not look silly, not look stupid and all of those things. Whereas actually we know that um, 
by having an appropriate level of humility in the appropriate environment in the appropriate way. So it's not putting yourself down or, you know, pretending you don't know stuff. It's a, a, appropriate. Then people find us more engaging. They trust us more. They want to work with us more. They want to buy more from us because they're getting an authenticity. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I, I mean I'm not a qualified psychologist about it, so this is just my own observations here. I think a lot of it can be traced back to if we look at the, the biggest single conflict zone that most people come across is school. So if you think about that school playground, you think about from primary going to secondary, it's a battlefield, relatively speaking here. And how people interact with you, how people shape you, you may leave school and be a completely different person from that. I'm not saying you always stay in that framework, but I think for some people, it's a flashback to that. There's a connection about how they were treated. They may not have dealt with that. Um, I'd probably recommend folks out, by the way, it might be an idea that uh, you, you want to really sort of put on the top of the agenda to create a, a real positive learning environment. We're going to talk about that on a different show, but I think culture, mannerisms, how you interact, and actually talking the talk as opposed to just talking about it as a, a policy is really important. Yeah, I, th I think that's um, that's really, really essential, actually, is, is to, to walk the talk, role model it as a leader, and... Um, and be open to challenge yourself. Um, there's a wonderful book that I recommend every business leader has a look at. If you don't want to read the book, there's the audio book and there's some short YouTube um, videos on this. Um, and that's a book called Radical Candor. And so just Google Radical Candor or put that into YouTube. It's without a, without a U because it's the American spelling. Obviously, the U I mean in candor. Um, so and there are two dimensions really there's the human it's about being really um challenging having challenging conversations but doing it in the right way so there's one axis which is about thinking about the human and the other axis which is about you know about the challenge and being direct and assertive and and you need to you know it's about balancing the two so we're being really direct but thinking about the human and how that feels and 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 how we're coming across so if the human, if you keep saying it and the human isn't getting it and you've tried saying it in different ways and, you, you know, you need to dial up the directness. But if, you, if, you're, um, if you're having an exchange and somebody seems to be getting upset, you need to dial down the directness and dial up the humanness sometimes. So it's about playing with those two things. And what the author of Radical Candor says is we need to do a few things. We need to firstly get it before we give it. And... Um, if we want people to listen to us, if we want people to accept sometimes that we don't agree with them, we need to be open to to disagreement ourselves and we need to be open to being wrong ourselves. So do you think there's got an element of uh, embracing the idea of fear of failure? So if you are somebody who is not particularly vocal, if you are going to be going to say, I, I need to challenge more, I need to contribute more, there's always that possibility that what comes out of your mouth okay, may be very badly received. It may not be how you think about it in your brain. You may not articulate it correctly. You may come up with something that's actually in reflection when you look at it in the cold light of day is particularly, I'll use the word stupid at this time of day and all the rest of it. It's not very, it doesn't give a good indicator of yourself here. Does it make a great deal of difference? I would say probably not. Uh, well, no, because if, if, you, if you say something and you think, oh, that didn't come out right, you say, you say, oh, Sorry, that didn't come out the way I intended. What I meant was this. And you you rephrase it. You put it right. Um, if you're not sure whether or not it's a stupid suggestion, you can say, this may be a silly idea, but, or I'm not sure if this is a daft question, but, right? And then say the question. So you can you can set yourself up so that it's, um, it's, it's safe for you to either lead into what you're about to say or that you can wriggle out of what you've just said because you didn't express it as well as you hoped. I think in the context of a meeting, uh, if you've got a meeting that's formally structured like with a chair, then I think the chair's got a big a lot of responsibility there yeah. to actually make sure the meeting's directed, inclusive, uh, uh, and all the, the, all the rules of engagement for a good meeting are actually met. But even chairs are human and they're dealing with discussion and debate, hopefully on the spot. And, you know, we all sometimes something comes out in a funny way and we just have to stop and put it right. But I think what we can all do is slow down. 
you know, we, we're very, very keen to jump in, to give an immediate response, to look decisive and look dynamic. And it only takes two or three seconds to have a breath, engage brain, and then engage gob. Um, you know, so if we all just slow down a bit, uh, we'll we'll take away um, some of the things we say that we wish we hadn't. Yeah, that, I think there's a great power, Joe, not just in uh, meetings, but in terms of selling, in terms of engaging with a customer. You see, use those two things there, the, the ears, and actually listen more and talk less. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's just, it's really interesting. But I think sometimes we're more, we stick more to being right at the expense of relationships. And often, we, often we're not as right as we think we are. You know, things are very rarely um, this or that. Things are very rarely binary. There's usually all sorts of shades of different things in between. And I think, I think it demonstrates that we can think flexibly. I think, and you can have two opposite thing, apparently opposite things, being true simultaneously as well. You know, that is, it is possible for for that to be the case. It's, it's amazing about how, how much in business and in life there's lots of parallels and lots of things we do. So when we've spoken before about innovation, about getting things out there, learning from things that have gone wrong, learning from your mistakes, <clears throat> I think it's the same in terms of discussions, contributions here, that if you, you know, if your input, if your interaction is not quite as you want it, you can learn from that, you can improve. It's a good way to reframe your mind. And I'd actually look, as I said, I like, because what are your admirable features? I know you're not a BS person, uh, so you tell it straight and direct. Do you think there are times when people are straight talking? And they should they adapt that depending on the, according to who the audience is? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, absolutely. You know, I'm only direct when I need to be. I'm only uh, you know, so I, I, I can ramp it right up, and um, there's no messing. Uh, you know, there's that level, and then there's being a lot more subtle with it and there's everything in between and I, so I think we need to adjust to the person the situation how important it this really is uh you know all of those things it's it you're right it's about being emotionally intelligent and I'm, I'm really just tuning in to ourselves and being self-aware and tuning into where other people are at as well 100 percent. that bit of empathy goes a long way yeah there are some situations though where I think we need to really focus on, if we feel like we're right, we need to stick to it. And they are things of principle, things that are our core values. You know, if somebody crosses, a core, if, somebody, if he holds me as a core value and a boundary is crossed, um, yes, we might understand why, we might empathise, we might forgive, we might do all, do all of those things, but we still need to hold on to those, to those things as being, you know, right for us. And um, I think when we're in that startup entrepreneurial phase of business or we're, we're about to do our next big win or whatever it is, you know, we need that conviction that we are right to drive us through. We need to listen to what's going on around us and, and adjust if we need to. But um, usually there are more reasons not to do something than there are to do something. Yeah, so, you, you've got to have your own red yeah. lines. You've got yeah. to have a certainty of that. And you've got to stick to it. I mean, the... Uh, in both our respects, it's sort of uh, starting ambitious careers as well. The, once you get to that clarity about where you want to end up and the path you've got to take, you get lots of people who are contributing ideas about, oh, you should do this, you should do that. And it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to think, oh, that person knows more than I do and deviate from your path that you've chosen there as well. Obviously, if you're heading for the a precipice of financial collapse, that might be different. But fundamentally, you've got to have your own red lines and you've got to know your own have that inner confidence and that inner still that says doesn't matter what everybody else has done this is the time that i'm going to stick to my ethics my value system uh, i'm not going to condone any sort of bad behavior toxicity anything that exploitative in that respect anything that's detrimental um and just stick to it because it will serve you very well yeah absolutely and i think we've all had times where we've gone against that intuition or that inner integrity and wish we hadn't um, I certainly have. I don't want to speak for everybody else, but uh, yeah, it, it serves as well in the end. Absolutely. So, Joe, just as sort of a roundup, then, what would your we'll, we'll give our nature? What would you your one tip that you say to people out there if they want to change things for the better? What, what's one thing they should do? 
I think um, don't be so focused on being right. Focus on learning and better listening and better communication and understanding. Okay, I like that. Uh, for me, uh, I would say it's about more about the outcome being the more important thing than who's actually right in that situation. So there are times when you've got to defer and you can think actually and reflect and listen to so use the ears. And I think for me, it's the outcome of what you want to achieve that's going to be more important than the actual person who's actually doing it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, but we'd love to know what you think as well, watching and listening. So let us know in the comments uh, what's resonated with you. Um, do you stick to being right and and um, or are you more open minded? And what's what experience have you had with some of the things we've been talking about? Obviously, folks, if you disagree with us, we know you're wrong. <laughs> and that was, by the way, a tongue in cheek, laugh out loud comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. So um, we'd love to hear from you. Check out the website as well, nextbigwin.co.uk. Head over and do our quiz over there. It'll tell you um, a bit more about your leadership style and how you can better set yourself up to achieve your next big win um, faster, less risk and more successfully. Super. Wonderful. Folks, see you next week. Take it easy. Take care. Bye.